Hello, my name is Tony, and this time out, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. John Craig. Who the fuck is that, you ask? Is it Daniel's brother, Wendy's husband? No, neither of those. John Craig is a fictional anti-hero assassin spy you've probably never heard of. Why have you never heard of him? Well, he was only in one movie, and that movie didn't exactly burn rubber at the box office or garner much, if any, critical adulation. But back in the mists of time, I saw it on the big screen at the Market Hall Cinema Bryn Mawr, and I can assure you, in its way, it's a minor classic slice of sub-bond entertainment with a pleasingly harder edge than most. It got an X certificate in the UK, over 18s, adults only folks, whereas the Bond movies fell into a cert territory for general audiences. Therefore, instantly appealing to my 13-year-old self. Thus I went, I saw, we got on famously. Who the hell is John Craig? Well, Craig, John Craig, is the invention of novelist James Monroe. And who the fuck is James Monroe? James Monroe is a pseudonym adopted by James Mitchell, the novelist and screenwriter who created Callan, the seminal late 60s to early 70s TV series. So, some pedigree behind him then? From 1964 to 1969, Mitchell hacked out four John Craig pulp novels under the Monroe alias. The Man Who Sold Death in 64, Die Rich, Die Happy in 64, the Money That Money Can't Buy in 67, and The Innocent Bystanders in 69. In the novels, Craig is a morally shadier, more grassroots version of Bond. He's an ex-special boat services officer, sounds a bit familiar, did some unpleasant wet work in World War II, a black belt martial artist and super proficient with firearms, and he's catnip to the ladies. They just throw themselves at him like fat chicks at a cake shop window. In his first book, he is the managing director of a shipping company dealing dodgy arms caches to Algeria. Some neo-fascist anti-Algerian organisation puts a contract out on him, so he goes on the run from his would-be killers in London and finds himself recruited into a covert British intelligence department, Department K. I'm guessing K doesn't stand for kinship or kissing or kinder surprise. He's given the job of assassinating the head of the organisation out to shine his clock, which is not only helpful and convenient for him, but also how his espionage career is kick-started. The fourth and final novel in the series, The Innocent Bystanders, was filmed in 1972 as Innocent Bystanders. It was scripted by Mitchell himself, who dropped the Monroe nom de plume for the credits, and it was directed by Peter Collinson. Collinson had previously directed two key British movies of the 60s, Up the Junction in 1968 and the classic Michael Caine comedy heist caper The Italian Job in 69. With an intriguing cast headed by Welsh superstar Stanley Baker, he of Zulu fame as John Craig, and including Geraldine Chaplin, Donald Pleasance, Darren Nesbitt, Dana Andrews, Sue Lloyd, Vladek Shabel, and Warren Alf Garnett Mitchell, it had all the makings of a major league winner. Yet somehow things didn't pan out that way, and there were no further John Craig novels written, and no more John Craig movies ever made. Well, so what? When I saw it, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I still hold it in great affection today. I might be the only one, but that won't stop me explaining why I get such a kick out of it. Might stop you watching this video any further, but that's an issue for you and your god. Me, I put the bloody and bloody minded, so I'll just thrust on and up regardless, matron. Imagine a spectrum. No, not the autism one, although I suppose there are similarities, but a spy movie spectrum, if you will. At the one end, you have James Bond, a sophisticated, iconic fantasy figure, the ultimate alpha male hero of the modern world, with all his accompanying paraphernalia. At the other, there is David Callan, a down beat lower class ex-con and army sergeant, a rebellious broken man with a troublesome conscience, living a seedy existence on the fringes of the espionage community in a very different type of cold war from that of his opposite number. Between Bond and Callan lie all the George Smiley's, Harry Palmer's, Charles Vines, Hugh Drummond's, Ethan Hunt's, Derek Flint's, Modesty Blazes, Napoleon Solo's, etc. They all occupy incremental positions on the spectrum, which places them in proximity to one character and his world, or the other. John Craig resides about here, closer to Callan, but with some faint aspirations towards the Bond end. Innocent Bystanders isn't Bond, not by any stretch, but neither does it aspire to be a committed exponent of the same kitchen sink aesthetic as Callan. So whilst not being Bond, it isn't really a grounded representation of the sort of Cold War world inhabited by the characters created by Lucario Dayton. Mitchell, I think, was hedging his bets. 
If you were left cold by the slick fantasy world of Bond and were a bit too upbeat for the downcast cynical vibe of Callan, this could have been right up your alley. And it's part of the film's problem, I think. Being something of a hybrid, it failed to find much favour with those expecting a Bond replica or those looking out for a grittier, more realistic proposition like Callan. People like me, a minority clearly, who had no real expectations either way, got a pacey, violent and engaging pulp spy thriller which sparked the target quite nicely, thank you very much. As for the rest, well, history speaks, I suppose. So what do you get? Story-wise this. Kaplan, Vladek Shebal, is a Russian Jew incarcerated in a gulag. He's an agronomist, an expert in the science of soil management and crop production. I looked it up. See, who says you can't be educational as well as offensive? He escapes with some of his mates and legs it to Turkey, where he drops off the radar. Kaplan has found a way to extract salt from seawater and plant crops in the desert. In London, head of Department K, Loomis, a wonderfully condescending and snobby superior Donald Pleasance, with a cruel line in withering observations and put-downs, meets with American intelligence honcho Blake, Dana Andrews. Blake's department has a leak they can't plug, so he wants Department K to find and retrieve Kaplan for them. The KGB are out to punch his button, so it's a race against time and opposing forces. Loomis will only agree if Blake provides him with a dossier outline in a plan for the Chinese to wage a coup on Hong Kong, which was still under British governance at the time. Yep, the Empire was still swinging its dick. Blake deems the price too high, so Loomis declines to be of service. However, he decides to use his department to go after Kaplan anyway for his own ends. Enter John Craig, an agent returning to active service following a mission where he was captured and tortured by the enemy. They plugged his nuts into the grid and ramped up the juice, leaving him physically and psychologically scarred and impotent. Craig, played with stony flair by craggy Stanley Baker, is tough, granite-faced and sports a luxuriant porno star moustache. He's aging, failing and damaged, falling below the standards now set by new agents on the block, 70s Dolly Bird Benson, Sue Lloyd, and the sneering blonde-haired sadist Royce Darren Nesbitt. As a test of his capabilities, Loomis charges Craig with the job of locating and securing Kaplan. Benson and Royce will be sent along as decoys, only it's Craig who is in fact the decoy, being thought of as past it and expendable. He's out there to draw fire, cannon fodder. Cast adrift up against Blake's American agents, the KGB, Benson and Royce and some other unidentified interested parties, Craig, alone and betrayed with no one to trust, forges ahead with his mission, intending to find and snatch Kaplan and sell him to the highest bidder. Kaplan's brother lives in New York and it is felt he knows where Kaplan is. Craig kidnaps Kaplan's ward, Miriam Lohman, played by Geraldine Chaplin, as she has committed to memory a coded postcard Kaplan has sent to his brother which contains clues as to his exact whereabouts. Together, Craig and Lohman jaunt through Turkey and Cyprus on their perilous quest, facing down danger and death at every turn, and a jolly good little outing it turns out to be. Should you give it a peep? Yeah, probably, but listen up first and then decide. It was made on a fraction of the budget of a Bond movie. It emulates certain tropes, though. The score by John Keating plunders John Barry's back catalogue with a varying degree of success. There's a song which aspires to be in a Bond theme, but it's pretty freaking dreadful. It's called What Makes the Man, and was co-written and performed by Norman Hurricane Smith. What makes the man who shakes your head? Smith had a big transatlantic hit in 1972 with Oh Babe, What Would You Say? I know what I'd say, don't write any more fucking songs. Location-wise, New York clearly isn't New York, probably London, and Cyprus is Spain, but in fairness, Turkey is Turkey, and looks just like one, i.e. a shithole. The locations are not particularly glamorous, being a bit spartan, drab and scruffy to be honest, but they do suit the more realistic lean-ins of the film. Some of the dialogue is sharp and well-observed, mine in a nice vein of cynicism and hard-nosed spite. Can I get you something? Could I have a dry martini? I shouldn't think so. However, some of it is mawkish and twee, Geraldine Chaplin bearing the brunt of having to deliver some really cringeworthy lines. The concept of a damaged trouble agent downshifting past his prime is a nod to Callan, and another reason why it sits where it does on the spectrum. Remember the spectrum? No? 
Okay, another waste of my fucking time and effort. In terms of action, there are quite a few well choreographed and crunchingly brutal scenes of unarmed combat. Much bruising and slugging. Things and people get shot, die and explode, and the narrative is quite propulsive and undemanding. Two torture sequences contained in its runtime are moderately harrowing to watch without being tastelessly explicit. We see Craig subjected to some more electric shock therapy. The current is turned off this time, but he doesn't know that and his mind does the rest, as well as landing some chemical based interrogation techniques. Miss Lohman is tied up and assaulted by Royce for information. He does something unspeakable to her breasts, I think. I don't like to imagine it being any lower down. These scenes may be responsible for the film getting a reference in the 2005 documentary Ban the Sadist Videos, which explored the video nasty witch hunt in the UK in the 1980s. Stanley Baker is physically and emotionally convincing as Craig, even with a porno moustache, but it's Donald Pleasance who steals the acting honours as the glacial, dead-eyed and ruthless Loomis. Darren Nesbitt was the stock go-to guy if you wanted a nasty piece of work, and he excels here, mocking and goading Craig with derogatory terms such as old man. Old, and just a little bit past it and generally being repulsively deviant and despicable. Sue Lloyd as Benson is the closest you'll find you to a Bond girl, and for comic effect we've got Warren Mitchell. Mitchell hails from a family of Russian Jews and was born and brought up in London. Here he plays Omar, a duplicitous Turk who speaks English with an Australian accent, complete with Antipodean slang terminology. This is explained by him having learned English from Australian troops during World War II. Yep, whatever. He is decent fun though. Geraldine Chaplin, Charlie's daughter, as the female lead, isn't your typical Hollywood beauty queen. She doesn't have the radiant glamour puss vibe of Liz Taylor, Grace Kelly or Faye Dunaway, nor is she anything like the voluptuous sex toy models, a Monroe or Raquel Welsh. She's thin, willowy and atypically attractive and sexy rather than classically pretty and obviously hot. She projects a magnetic sort of feminine vulnerability and this lends a sense of authenticity to her on-screen relationship with Baker's character. It feels more real than the customary rocks-off approach with some of the pneumatic fantasy sex symbols in a traditional Bond or Bond imitation flick, and that's a refreshing change for this type of film. From my personal perspective, Glenda Jackson was the sexiest woman alive at the time, so Miss Chaplin, who possessed certain similar qualities, did it for me. Unlike Glenda though, she didn't whip her baps out at the drop of a clapperboard, more's the pity, but you can't have it all, so I'm reliably told. Needless to say, her character Miriam, Miss Lohman, isn't all she seems to be, as is par for the course in this sort of movie, but she does manage to reinvigorate Craig's libido, bringing life back to the old man's old boy, so to speak. There are no jaw-dropping stunts or major pyrotechnic set pieces here. Everyone is a villain to a greater or lesser degree, with Craig and Loman being the most human and relatable characters. Even Kaplan is a bit of a twat, having betrayed his fellow escapees, so that now they are also hunting him for revenge. Does our flawed hero prevail in the end? Well, without giving the game away, it comes to a satisfyingly positive conclusion, which made me smile on my first viewing. I liked it anyway. If you're on the lookout for a pulpy 70s spy thriller solidly made, capably acted and engaging, it will more than fit the bill. It's not Bond, it's not camp, and it's not a slave to realism, but it is entertaining stuff, and the plot makes a lot more sense than Puppet on a Chain. Once again, thank you for your time and attention. If you feel so inclined, striking like, constructing a comment, or smacking subscribe is always appreciated, but purely optional. I'm trying to build up the courage to watch Shatter again, a latter-day Hammer film from 1974, and I'm attempting to build up the courage to review it. I'll need an increased alcohol intake beforehand, so bear with me if you're feeling desperate to see someone run through this thing. I have to get the balance just right between blind drunk and comatose, but it will happen. That's no idle threat, kids. Meanwhile, here's a song called, unsurprisingly, Innocent Bystanders. I gotta work on these segues. Oh
look away, give me space, bad things happen to good people for no reason. A wrong day, wrong place, innocent bystanders are always in season. I'm a curse, I'm no good, I'm a reason to run. Innocent bystanders are always in season. Ah.